morning. Good morning. Last week, I gave you an assignment. And that was five times a day, take a deep breath and say, let it be. So I'm curious, did anybody try it and how did it work? When did you use it? Does someone have a story to tell us? I found it very helpful. Uh, there's a co-worker that I, I just find it really difficult <laughs> to okay. be around her. Uh -huh. And uh, so quite a few times when uh, she was cheating the system or whatever it was, I did that. And uh, then I was able to just smile and keep on with my work. Good. Other stories. Yeah, I tried to, and, uh, at work, I find it kind of helpful. It's kind of a stressful demand because the environment. I think the people I, people I work for, you know, people that come in to see me, I think they probably, I don't want to speak for them, but I, I think they probably appreciated a little bit more focus. I think the people I work with probably appreciated not uh, having as, I hate to say I'm a difficult person, but, you know, having the most difficult me there. <coughs> I must confess that this week I used that phrase most often as I was getting ready for this sermon. My usual sermon preparation method is that I read the scriptures and then God hands me a sermon and my job is not to screw it up from there on. And this week that didn't seem to work. That's the only method I've got. Um, so, so I took a deep breath and said let it be and this is what resulted. This week, we add a word to that phrase, let it be so. And that's in some ways very different because let it be is just like, well, like whatever. Right? It can be, you know, I don't care anymore, or you know, I'm not gonna say anything, or you know, all of these possible things. But but let it be so <clears throat> is more clearly, it's not exactly what Mary says. Um, but, but it, it sort of captures, I think, the spirit of it. She says, let it be with me. But she also says, let it be with me according to your word. Right? Because she's just had this word. She's got this angel standing in front of her saying, this is what's going to happen. And her response is, let it be according to this. Right? Not just like anything, but this what you promised. Right? This is what I will let be. So it's a very specific kind of let it be, let it be so according to your word. Which in some ways is less helpful for the rest of us because we tend not to get angels. I mean it would be much simpler to let it be if we had an angel come and tell us what's going to be going on in the next few months and then right, if we, we could just let that go and say okay if that's what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen, let it be so. But we're sort of stuck in this world without angels most of the time. Um, I don't know how often you see angels, but I tend not to see them at all. And so here we are. Now, actually the early church had the same sort of problem. So it's not like this is a new problem. 
And so this is where the, the second Peter reading comes in. That in, in large parts of the early church, they were expecting Jesus to come again soon. And soon in the, in the very typical sense of soon, soon. Like any day now, any week now. Like seriously, we're going to have to wait another month? Right? And so the early church would have been very shocked if someone would have come to them and said, oh, by the way, in 2,000 years, the church is still going to be reading this stuff and still going to be waiting. They would be very surprised because... Right? And so Second Peter, as, as a book, is actually written mostly about the problem of how come Jesus isn't here yet? Right? This 2,000-year-old book is dealing with, with this specific question. And so... Um, Right? But, but still, right, it can be useful to us right, as we wait or as we sort of move forward. Because Peter says, okay, well, you know, Jesus isn't coming, she just didn't come yesterday or the day before, so as, as life goes on, how do we live our lives? So I want to pull a couple of phrases out of Second Peter this morning and see if they have something still to say to us. The first phrase that was read this morning that I found, that I, this was the one I fought with all week. It says, strive to be found at peace. And I thought, well, like there seems to be like an inherent contradiction in this phrase. Because being at peace is, well, being at peace. And striving is about doing stuff. So how can you strive to be at peace? Right? And so it, it, it felt like I was, I was, you know, like this phrase was calling me to do two things, two opposite things at the same time. Right? Get out there and do, be at peace. Get out there and do, be at peace. At the same time. Right? Not strive so that you can be at peace, but strive to be at peace. On the other hand, the reality also is that whenever I've tried to be at peace, I've discovered that it is indeed a lot of work. That it doesn't just happen. There might be some people for whom peace just happens, or they're sort of born peaceful and they live their lives in peace and they die in peace. But I'm guessing those people are very rare. <coughs> and I don't think there's a lot of them here among us, because I don't think there's a lot of them at all. The strive part, I'm guessing for most of us, comes a little easier. And, and fortunately, it's not like the strive part is wrong, because we're supposed to strive. And, and it fits well with, so we're, like I said last week, we're starting in the Gospel of Matthew. And Ma or sorry, in Mark. And Mark is very much the strive sort of Gospel. And one of Mark's favorite phrases is, and immediately. And immediately Jesus did this. And, and immediately this happened. It's sort of, right, this is Jesus on steroids. Right? Mark is always busy, 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 and then he dies. Very, very quick. Right? So lots of, lots of striving. And yet, right, as we go through Mark, we're going to see a Jesus, and immediately, and immediately, but always somehow at peace. Or at least mostly always somehow at peace. So these two things are not, are not opposite. Or what we read from Mark this morning, you know, the, the quote from Isaiah, prepare the way of the Lord. I'd always, somehow, I always had in, in my mind this idea that this was going to be God's task. I don't know why I thought that. And it sort of struck me this week, you know, that's, that's our task. Now part of it, of course, is that right, making the mountains plain right, and filling in the valleys is a lot of work. I, I grew up in the prairies. And so like making the rough places plain, I'll give me a shovel, 15 minutes, no problem. Right? It's pretty much done already. But here in West Virginia, we can see that, that it could be a bit more of a trick doing that, if that's our, you know. I mean, even, even with mountaintop removal, Right? For generations now, for years we've had mountaintop removal, it's still pretty hilly around here. Right? And lots of valleys still need to be filled in. Right? So there's a, there's a lot of work um, here in West Virginia on 
preparing the way of the Lord. And yet, somehow we need to always balance that with strive to be at peace. Another way that Peter talks about this is he says, as, he's, as you're going through your life, do not lose your stability. Right? Which I think fits well, right? Strive to be at peace. Do not lose your stability. And Peter doesn't give us a lot of details as to exactly what he means by your stability. And so we're just going to have to sort of fake that one. Right? In a sense, so, so what do we think? What, what is, I don't know, what is your stability? And when you think about your life, think about what gets you through a week, right? What is your stability? What is the, what is the foundation you're sitting on? And hopefully part of that is that you are a beloved child of God. That whatever happens during your week, you are a beloved child of God and you stand on that. And that, that is not something that can be taken away from you, but it's certainly something you can forget. And it's certainly possible to act from other sorts of foundations. Lots of our lives we act in ways that <coughs> don't well show our stability. Do not lose your stability. But, Peter tells us, grow in grace and knowledge. And again, for most of us here, growing in knowledge is the obvious one. Right? We are educated, we are educators, right? we like to learn stuff. Grow in knowledge. And this is sort of one of those things that's mostly true. And I say it's mostly true because I don't get this overwhelming response when, it's, when I suggest we could have a Bible study. You know, that people in some ways seem to be content with their quantity of knowledge in, in some areas of their lives. Right? But for the most part in our lives, right, growing in knowledge is something that's important to us. But we also know the limits of that. We know the limits of, yeah, you can learn another bunch of stuff. So a few weeks ago, I was getting ready for, uh, to, play, to play hockey, so we're sitting in the, in the locker room getting our stuff on, and the person next to me says, so Wes, like, how do you get your skates sharp? And I said, sharper? He says, because like, you can get them sharpened like, with a quarter inch radius or a three eighths radius. And so then this, this discussion started in the locker room about like, so what radius do you prefer, and where do you go to get your skates sharpened, and you change the rocker on your blade, and sometimes you can there's this way of doing it so it works better for defensemen and this way of doing it, you know, honestly, I get them sharper and sharper, but you know, there was this long, very technical discussion based on lots of knowledge about how to get skates sharper. <coughs> and then we got on the ice, and it became very, very quickly apparent that for the guys having the discussion, it made no difference at all, because they just couldn't skate. <laughs> right, and they could have, they, they would have been just as fine with dull skates as with sharp skates. They weren't going to move fast enough that they were ever going to notice whether they were on quarter inch or three eighths inch radius blades. Right, so there's this limit to knowledge. They had all of this knowledge that I didn't have about the technicalities of blades, um, but the technicalities of actually standing on your skates is, is a different sort of thing. Right. So, so we, we strive to grow in knowledge, but Peter says, strive to grow in grace and knowledge. Grace is a word I've been struggling with ever since I survived Lutheran Seminary many years ago. Um, but for me, it, it's, it's come to mean living in a way that is free from fear and judgment. Which is, again, all part of this same sort of thing, right? Strive to be at peace. Do not lose your stability. And you can do that, and you can move forward, and you can strive and act when you can do all of this without being afraid of judgment. That God says, no, all of this stuff that you're going to do next week is already covered. 
Never mind the stuff you did last week. It's already covered. It's already taken care of. And so if you're walking into a situation and you're not sure what to do, the one thing you don't have to worry about is fear and judgment. That's, that's right. The fear and the judgment of God is not part of this anymore. So we start there. Right? And then we apply our knowledge. And then we act. And then we go back and do it all over again. Right? It's this constant circle. All of this with this goal of being at peace. Recognizing that we strive. So that's your task for this week. Giving you a new phrase this week. Your new phrase is, strive to be at peace. I invite you to live this week in that tension. The tension between striving and being at peace. May God be with you.